far. Don't ever let somebody tell you you can't do something. Wait a minute. You ain't heard nothing yet. You are listening to the Live to Create podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the official Live to Create podcast coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee. I am your host, Shane Ongren, and I am joined today from Gasparilla Island in Florida by toy and game inventor Ren Geyer. Ren is a serial entrepreneur in a variety of creative fields, including toys and games, music publishing, education, and art. He is perhaps best known as the inventor of Nerf and Twister and is a member of the Hasbro Toy and Game Inventors Hall of Fame. Geyer also has founded music publishing company Rensong Music of Nashville. He is also the creator of Windsor Learning, an educational program for remediating those with dyslexia. And he is the author of the book, Right Brain Red, Seven Ideas for Creative Success. Ren, thank you so much for joining me today. It is an honor to have you on the show. Well, it's nice to be here, Shane. Um, can you tell us, how does one break into the toy and game invention business in the first place? And what were you doing before that? Well, um, I was, uh, my father had started a um, design company uh, he had been a vice president and director of new product development for a paper company and uh, as such had uh, over 120 patents with his name on it. Uh, when he left the paper company to start his own business uh, with an eye toward trying to make packaging for large uh, Fortune 500 companies and to uh, make in-store displays for Fortune 500 companies. And so I was working in that company and, and had become a co-owner of that company with my father in the business. And that's what my profession was at the time. Uh, we would design them and sell them to them. Did you go to school for design or was that something you just picked up from your dad? How did you get into designing? Well, when I got out of school, I had planned to be a writer. And uh, he said, just come with me. I have just started this company. He said, uh, you know, let's see what happens. And so I did. I joined him. And he had already hired. He had been in business for about six months uh, when I joined him. And he had already hired uh, several very competent graphic artists to uh, design the display materials. We, uh, the company also did uh, graphic design for uh, large companies. Uh, what's an example? Well, we did all of the packaging for Land O'Lakes, for instance. Mm -hmm. and uh, redesigned logos for people. We also did that. So we had uh, the artists were kept busy uh, doing things, and uh, my father stuck me at a drawing board in the middle of these artists, uh, and uh, I watched <laughs> because I really didn't. Uh, I had taken some art classes, and I was, you know, a fledgling artist, but not very competent. And I watched what their methods were. And back then, there were no computers, of course, uh, back in the uh, late 1950s. So uh, a lot of it was copying from magazine ads and uh, catalogs. And a lot of the work was done by tracing, by putting tracing paper over it. Mm -hmm. And so you would start with that and a sketch. You'd develop the sketch that way. So I saw what they were doing. And so I would take home uh, some tracing paper and I would find some ads or something like that, something visual. And I would start tracing over it just to see what came out of it. Right. And I discovered that if you focused on making sure that the darks were accurate, the pieces of dark in the illustration or in the photograph were, were properly uh, replicated or traced, uh, you take the, the photo away from underneath the tracing paper and voila, you have something that looks pretty much like the photo that you just had underneath the tracing paper. Huh. And so I soon realized that 
if you look, I soon began, began to be able to look around the room or look anywhere and, and essentially by making an accurate depiction of the dark portions uh, or the shadowed parts, you will come up with an accurate depiction of what you're looking at. And so I got pretty good at etching, and I got pretty good at looking at what I saw and replicating it. I actually think if I get time in this life, I'd like to write the book that uh, tells that little secret and, and has people practice that with tracing paper. It is a shortcut to understanding visual art because it's a shortcut to learn how to sketch. Hmm. Uh, but I haven't done it yet. <laughs> <laughs> but, cool, I'm going to try uh, that. So I became a pretty good artist, and then as I began to understand the business and, and, and saw how the in-store displays were designed and created, I got pretty good at that, and uh, then started to go out and begin to find some clients of my own usually out of town in Chicago. Uh, our business was in Minneapolis from St. Paul, and, and that's in Minnesota. And uh, <laughs> we, I would go to Chicago and Cincinnati and Milwaukee and uh, St. Louis and so forth and would find new clients. And that's what I was about doing I really wasn't very excited. As I got, as I learned the business, I began to question whether or not it really was a good business model. We were making display materials for very prestigious companies back then. It was 3M and Pillsbury and Kraft Foods and so forth. We would make one one year and it worked and we would have some success with it. But next year, they would look at us and say, well, what are you going to do for us this year? <laughs> and then there would be a competition, and we would either win or lose that comp competition against uh, competitors of ours. And it just didn't seem like it had any staying power. We were always trying to reinvent the wheel, and it, it was difficult. There was no residual opportunity there. Mm-hmm. So uh, I kept looking for new ideas, new things that we could get ourselves into. And at one point, I tried something called Pizza in the Round. Uh, pizza was just coming on in the early 50s. And so also was the Radar Range, as it was then known. And there weren't very many of those around uh, that, of course, became known as microwaves. And so I tried to match those together and had an artist, actually a very prominent architect, design a, a building that uh, looked like a Venetian building wherein people could drive up at one end and place their order and drive around to the other side and then um, about a minute have uh, the pizza they wanted. Fortunately, I found that my uh, knowledge of the business of pizza and the purchasing thereof, of uh, the ingredients were really lacking, and uh, <laughs> I, I, I did pull back from that, fortunately, uh, before I got in too deep. Uh, but those were the kinds of things I was looking for. Okay, so you have, you've got a creative bent, you, you've you got the drive to do something, and what did you, I mean, because Twister, you didn't sit down and create Twister. It started out as, I think it was called Pretzel, like, what was the concept, the initial concept? What, what did you first start working on? Well, I was trying to develop a product that could be a self-liquidating premium which meant that if you sent in the label from something in a dollar, you would get something. Uh, it isn't done much anymore, but it was, it was rather popular back then. And I was trying to do it for a shoe polish product for one of my clients. And I thought, well, let's see, it was kids' shoe polish. And back then, moms polished their kids' shoes, believe it or not. That's an ancient art also. <laughs> yes, it is. And so I was working at my desk and all of a sudden I 
I had this idea, if you take the kids, put them on this mat, and you make some squares, and, and you have them go around on the mat, and they realize, oops, wait a minute, this idea is bigger than that. There is something here because there's nothing on the market where the game is played by people. In other words, people are the players. Yeah, usually it's a board game with little figurines marching around the board. board and the board is on a tabletop. So I went out in the bullpen where all of our artists were and pulled out a great big sheet of corrugated board, which we worked with often. And I drew one foot squares, four going uh, one way and six going another. And so there were 24 squares on it. And then I invited eight people and made teams of two out of the eight people. We had the yellow team, the green team, the blue team, and the red team. And each one of them were at a corner of the board, each team. And the object was for, in their turn, for one of those players to move forward to another square. And the first team that got to a square opposite them or kitty corner from them uh, would be the winner. Well, it didn't take more than seven or eight turns. And everybody was bunched up in the middle. We had eight <laughs> artists and uh, assistants and of, all, of all type. And everybody from our offices joined in. And pretty soon we were laughing so hard that <laughs> it was obvious that the game, there, it wasn't a game. But that was what sparked me because it was so funny and so much fun. I knew that there was something really intrinsically right about this. So I, over the next uh, month or two, I developed a game that had squares on it and had four people on the board. A team, two teams of two. It was a game of tic tac toe, basically. It's still a good game. It's a, it's a cute game, and we have not been able to convince uh, Hasbro to put it out. But it's kind of a game that older people would love to play because they don't have to play Twister and get down on their hands and knees, but <laughs> can still play a game where they bunch up. I called it King's Footsie. The players would put uh, bands of either blue or red cloth around their feet, Roman sandal style, and they would try to get four in a row four colors in a row, and I took it to 3M, who then had a, a whole line of very sophisticated and excellent strategy games. They were tabletop games, and they were friends of mine because uh, they were one of our clients for whom we developed their in-store displays for their Scotch tape division. And they looked at it for a while, and as I suspected they would, uh, they turned it down because it really didn't fit the upscale market that they were shooting for. And they thought it was wonderful, but it, it, it just didn't fit. And that was no surprise. So I put it on the shelf. So it was sitting on a shelf when a salesman who was trying to get the business of uh, doing some printing for us, and he, his name is Chuck Foley, he saw the game sitting on the shelf of our purchasing agent, and so what's that? And the purchasing agent, Phil Shaber, said, that is a game that Ren invented. Oh, really? Chuck Foley said, well, I have uh, worked for a game company in town at one time, and can I talk with Ren? And so he came in, and, and we chatted, and he convinced me that he had some knowledge of how the toy and game industry worked. And he said he had a friend, uh, Neil Rabins, whom he could bring together. So I went to my father, and I said, you know, my dad had seen uh, the fun we had had playing the game we took to 3M, the King's Footsie. And I said, you know, I think this is a, a valid idea. It's a big idea. And it's, it's a big chance. We're taking a big risk. But if we could get someone to come up to, you know, sell some games where the people are the players, then we might uh, be able to start a new division. So he bought it. He said, all right, I'll underwrite this division that would be 
Foley and Rabins and myself who would try to develop some games around the people are the players idea. So uh, he went to the bank and he underwrote it for two years. And we started in working on it. Over the, about a year and a half, we developed eight games where people are the players. And they ranged from young kids' games to word games with uh, alphabets and letters on the board. But in each instance, uh, each one of the games went after a different demographic. Uh, one of the most, one of our favorite, I guess our favorite, was the one where we had once again, 24, by this time, the, the squares that we had uh, with the four different colors had turned into circles. Mm -hmm. And at one point, Chuck Foley said, well, let's put the colors, rather than having them dotted around with people standing on them, uh, let's have them in a row. So we tried that. It looked better. And then uh, Ravens said, well, what if we have them put their hands and their feet on it? And so we tried that. That seemed to work. And so the team was functioning very well. We had taken the essential idea, and uh, there was a game that we were calling pretzel, where you spun the spinner and said right hand green, left hand blue, etc. And we took all eight of those games to Milton Bradley, to a, a head of uh, the new product development, and vice president of new product development was Mel Taft. And he said, okay, this is really a unique, it's way out of our range, you know. We, they were doing their best game at that point, was the game of life. Mm -hmm. So they took the, and Mel said, well, let's start off with the pretzel game. And so they did. And Mel convinced his management that this would be a unique idea. And they went along with it. And they found that there was a, a product out there that had pretzel attached to it. So they came back with the name Twister, which when I heard that, it was like, oh, my God. I was born and raised in the Midwest, and I know what it's like when the Twisters come across the prairie. And it ain't no fun. <laughs> and I thought Twister was a very dangerous name. But on we go. Solid proof that it really doesn't make much difference what you call something. Once it is what it is, people simply attach the name to it and have no problem with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we later proved that with Nerf. So they, they decided to bring the game out. We, everything was going along beautifully. And just before Christmas, uh, 1965, Mel Taft called me and said, Red, I am very, very sorry, but the retailers are not responding to this game. They think it's risque. They think it's so different that nobody's going to understand it. And we're going to pull the game from the market. We're going to pull all of our spot ads. I'm very sorry, but it's, it's, it's over. And this was a real crusher for us. Unbeknownst to anybody in the Milton Bradley Company, in May, uh, May 3rd exactly, of 1966, Mel Taft had known that the public relations company that they had used and were using had already been paid and already had gotten the Tonight Show people who featured Johnny Carson and got them to agree to put the game on the Tonight Show. Well, that night, uh, Mel Taft and the PR person sat in the audience and watched as Ava Gabor enticed Johnny onto the mat, and it was all she wrote. The next morning, uh, there were at least 50 people lined up at Abercrombie & Fitch, which is one of the few places where they still had games that hadn't been returned. And... It turned everything around. All of a sudden, Milton Bradley called and said, we're going with it, and it became the game of the year in 1966 and 67, and it's been going ever since. 
So after the massive success that you guys had with Twister, you created a company yourselves just to develop games and toys after that? I did. Foley, uh, Chuck Foley and Neil Ravens had decided that they wanted to have their own company. I tried to convince them to be a part of uh, and run a division of ours. And unbeknownst to me, they had convinced uh, the son of a car dealer in town to put some money into a company that uh, they started uh, outside of ours. So they they moved on. Uh, They went their own way. And uh, so we had no division for developing toys and games. And I thought for quite a while about what I wanted to do and finally decided that I would rather be a toy and game designer than a in-store display designer for the rest of my life. I don't know whether it would, I didn't know, (laughs) I didn't know a lot, as a matter of fact. (laughs) It was a risky move. I made an, an arrangement with my father. The, the half of the business that I owned in the display business, I would return to him plus half of the royalties of Twister. And I would take the royalties of Twister at that time. They were generous enough to allow me to do this. And I put together a team of five of us, took a spot in next to, I had, I had bought a, a building in uh, the uh, eastern part of Minneapolis, and it was quite a large old warehouse. So I said, I'll build a, a, an office for myself next door, and uh, I'll share the bookkeeping of these two companies, uh, the display company and my new company. And I'll share, we'll, I'll rent this space from you. And so I put together a modest office, two or three rooms, and a lot of room to play in. And we designed a, a large room where all five of us faced each other with our drawing boards so that the communication amongst us would be open and, and run freely. I also developed a quiet room so that we could have meetings and could play uh, board games if we, that we would develop. And so that's, that's what it did. I called it Windsor Concepts. And during one of these sessions, you guys came up with, if I'm not mistaken, you guys were working on a caveman game that had foam rocks that you threw. That's correct. And tell us what that turned into. Well, you know, there was a period of about uh, a year and a quarter where we really hadn't come up with much. And uh, one day, one of our designers said, well, he was working on an idea that the people or the players, and it was kids that would step on pieces of flat plastic or paper that looked like rocks, and they would walk around on these rocks, and then they would, if they would also have some money or script, which they would put under the rocks, essentially to hide the hide the money and stash it away so nobody knew where it was. And if somebody else came along and tried to steal that money from underneath the rock, each of us had a couple of black foam rocks that were rough hewn, hacked out of black foam that was used for padding back then. And we could throw those rocks at each other to stop that person from stealing the money. It was a terrible game. <laughs> it, would, it, it would never work. But the, but the ethic that I encourage in the business was that never doesn't make any difference what we're doing, what we're testing. Just go through with it. In other words, do it. Don't talk about it. Don't talk yourself out of it. And so... We were doing it, and uh, the hope always was for me that, okay, maybe something else will come out of it. Well, in that day, on that day, something else did come out of it, because all of a sudden we started throwing these black rock at each other, and the laughter and fun that followed made us all realize, wait a minute, there's something here that's much bigger than these little rocks. And we all went to our design tables 
and we found different durometer or different weights of polyester and polyether foam rocks. And we cut them out with scissors first. And I still have one in a small imitation uh, mahogany box. <laughs> and uh, I use it uh, occasionally to, to show people. But we all cut them out of these out of uh, foam and then discovered that there already was a technology, a methodology for cutting foam with hot wire. So we determined that if you take a hot wire and you take a straight wire and then make a, a big round circle, half round circle, and then continue the wire on, and then heat the wire up and then twist the wire, out comes a ball. Hmm. And so we did, and we made several balls of different uh, weight and durometer. And then uh, we felt like, well, nobody's going to just buy a ball. So we went about inventing a whole line of uh, games and toys that use the ball as the essential ingredient and foam as the essential ingredient and took it to Milton Bradley, took all these games to Milton Bradley, our friend Mel Taft. And Mel and his team said, no, it's not going to work. We are a game company and we're not going to get into toys. So that was very disappointing. But we turned around then and took it to Parker Brothers. And a gentleman by the name of Henry Simmons was the head of product development at that time. And Henry convinced his group to come out with not a bunch of games with foam in it or made from foam. He decided that he would put one of these foam balls in a very square box and put them on the market just as a single ball in a box. But we thought that was crazy. <laughs> until all of a sudden they began to sell a few million of them and uh, our, <laughs> they proved us wrong once again. And of course, from then on, they began to realize that we really had something. We had shown them something, a whole new technology that they could work with. And they came back and, and said, okay, Ren, will you sign a contract that says that we have the exclusive use of everything you develop in foam and we will pay you for everything we have that's foam. And at that point, I wasn't sure because Parker Brothers was a game company, not a toy company. And this was a shot in the dark for them as much as it was for us. Mm -hmm. So... I finally decided, you know what, they're good marketers. They know how to market product. I'm not going to start spreading this around the industry. Let's let them go with it. And I'm very happy. In the long run, I was very happy that I did that. And they have gone quite a distance with the Nerf line. Yeah, that, that product had a small bit of longevity, I'd say. <laughs> they're doing pretty well. Um so there's a popular theory that NERF is an acronym for non-expanding recreational foam. Can you confirm or deny that? I will deny that. Uh, it, the name came from someone, there was someone in the advertising or public relations or some part of the design or assist some group that was assisting Parker Brothers. And one of the guys said, well, let's call it, let's name it for what they call the foam that they pad the roll bars of sheets as they are going through the tundra in California. And they were always called Nerf bars. So that stuck. And so they called it Nerf. And that's where it came from. You said in an interview with CNBC that a lot of the ideas that you work with break a rule. What did you mean by that, and how does that apply to, for example, Twister and Nerf? Well, I can give you a very short synopsis, I think, of some of the points that I make in my book, Right Brain Red. Mm -hmm. And it, I think you'll understand where I'm going with this when I finish. In the book, I say that 
everybody, as far as I'm concerned, is creative. So do not exclude anybody from a creative opportunity. But it is so rare that one person will be the sole creator of an idea. Quite frankly, I've never met one. So what I think and I know works and has worked for me is teams of people. There are teams of two, three, four, or five people. Each one of those have uh, advantages and disadvantages, but more than five, uh, it just don't work. You have a committee, and committees have no luck doing anything. <laughs> well In said. my book, I, I, I quote it's, uh, uh, the end of a poem I wrote about commit, uh, it's called Commit a Committee. But once you've got a team together or you've joined a team, and then the other thing I say in the book is use wherever possible and start every sentence with the three magic words, what happens if. <laughs> they are absolute magic and people say, well, why not use just what if? What if, as far as I'm concerned, starts children's nursery rhymes or children's uh, stories. What if there was a land where such and such happened? But what happens if, what happens if we launch in June, okay? Well, that takes into consideration what happens before we launch. It takes into consideration what happens when we launch, during the launch, and what happens and will be the results after the launch. So it requires reviewing all aspects of, instead of asking the question, well, what if we? So the three magic words, as far as I'm concerned, are what happens if. I love that. That's brilliant. Once a team arrives at an idea that they think may have some merit, the first thing that they need to do is stop talking. Do not allow themselves to get into, well, why, why isn't it going to work? And uh, I, in my book, I, I show a couple of examples of uh, instances where uh, we left a lot of ideas on the table by talking ourselves out of it. The first thing you do when you think you have an idea as a team is make one. Go to your, uh, whatever your bench is or your drawing board or whatever it is, but don't just draw it, don't make a sketch, make one. Make It doesn't make any difference how crude or rough it is, but essentially it means do something. Don't sit around and try to figure out why it will or won't work. Oftentimes, and most of the time, when you are doing something, making something, the idea that you thought was going to work, you find that there are flaws in it. But you also find, often, that something else works. In other words, you start up one road, and pretty soon there are branches, or let's say you go up to the center of the tree, watch out for those branches that may really bear a lot of fruit, because oftentimes that's what happens, and, and it is by doing that leads you to that new and unusual idea. And if that idea that you've been led to is any good, you will usually find that it breaks a rule. Hmm. I've been fortunate enough to have several products that have broken rules uh, very successfully. Say, let, let's say Twister, which we've been talking about. Twister is it's very simple. Uh, back in even now, there is some thought that people really shouldn't be allowed to get in that close proximity to the other person in a social setting if they're not dancing. <laughs> and 
The other one, uh, the Nerf, we were talking briefly about that. The rule that's broken there is no throwing balls in the house. I have a new dice game called uh, Rally Roll, and the dice actually in Rally Roll are not configured like regular dice. They are uh, cubes, but they have different graphics on them. And it's amazing. People have no problem seeing that, oh, well, okay, the graphics are different. But it makes for an extremely exciting game where uh, every player is involved in the other player's action. And, and by changing the graphics on the dice, we're breaking, definitely breaking a rule. So it often happens. Breaking a rule works. At, at this point in your career, you've probably made enough to retire and go uh, live in a tropical private island, but you still keep creating. You still keep inventing. You're still doing you know, sculptures and artwork. What is it that compels you to keep finding new creative outlets? Well, that too is a, a part of my book that kind of closes it up. Uh, and it, I do. I have been fortunate enough to find a small tropical island, Casparilla Island in Florida. <laughs> and that happens to be our home. <laughs> oh, so I got that right. <laughs> uh, uh, that was good. I'm glad you did that. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Uh, you knew that. You knew that. I knew you. I, I thought you were in Florida, but yeah, I didn't know you had your own tropical island. <laughs> What's the uh, name of it? Well, Gasparilla Island. It's uh, in between Fort Myers and Sarasota. So, uh, yes, you ask me what keeps me going. It's It's the rush that keeps me going. There is when you come on to an idea that you really think could work and would be fun for the world to have, I find that I am drawn to that idea because there's a rush that comes with it. There's an excitement that every time I go to working on that product or that idea, I'm encouraged. I am lifted. There is a there is a rush that go, uh, is the way I describe it that goes with it, and uh, I'm fortunate enough to be able to keep on seeking the rush. I guess you've got a number of grandkids and even a couple great grandkids. Yep. When you see all the technology and the way kids are buried in their phones and their tablets these days. How, how does that make you reminisce for the old days and how do you treat your kids or your grand, I'm sorry, your grandkids differently? When they come to your house, what can they expect to be doing over there? Well, we play some, some of the games that uh, sometimes that we've developed and they're not, uh, I mean, the kids uh, are oftentimes on games on their cell phones or their, or their pads, whatever. And, uh, that's fine. They're so, some of them, especially the teenagers, are glued to their uh, telephones. But when we get together as a group, we, we will so oftentimes, we'll be testing some of the new ideas that I have and we have. And I don't think, <laughs> I'm not one that thinks that this generation, this, the new generations uh, lack any drive or any creativity or uh, have lost any essential interest in making the world a better place. Uh, I really think that uh, we have a great bunch of kids coming along in our nation and in the world. What advice would you have for either kids growing up or for anyone out there who wanted to be an inventor, who thought of themselves as one, maybe not necessarily in the toy or the game industry, just inventors in general? Well, the, the, the seven things that I point to in my book, some of which uh, I pointed to earlier, uh, such as uh, form a team and use the three magic words and, uh, you know, believe in your creativity, believe that you are creative. And 
You know, even we are moving toward something new. For instance, uh, we are in the process of developing a new product that will be a, not a podcast, but it, it will be on YouTube and uh, mm -hmm. it'll be a channel based on some of the writings that Jeff Harrington and I have done for kids called Curly Lasagna. And I am taking the part of the, the grandfather, America's grandfather, and we're fairly far down the, the line on this. And we'll be introducing it within the, within the next four or five months. And Curly Lasagna, that's a series of its stories and songs for kids? Yep. It's one that Jeff Harrington and I, I wrote the stories and songs, and Jeff put music to them 25 years ago. And all of a sudden we realized, wait a minute, for some reason those are more valuable now. They were a little ahead of themselves at that time, but they seem to fit this generation of kids very well. So we're using that as part of our website, as it were, not website, it's not really a website, it's, it's a YouTube site. We're reaching into new things uh, as we speak. <laughs> Where do you get your new ideas from? What is your biggest source of inspiration? I think ideas are in the air. I think ideas are all around us. I do know, and I really believe this, that the ideas that come to me and that I'm made aware of, I have an obligation if they are seemingly unique. These are my gifts. Uh, they are, in whatever way they, they have arrived in my consciousness and in, in, in my possession, as it were, uh, I have a responsibility to make them real, to bring them to the world. That's, if I simply sat back and, and said, oh, wouldn't that be a good idea? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be fun? Uh, I would not be honoring that gift that uh, I have been given. So, in part, that's what keeps me going. I, I really believe that uh, that's something that it's uh, a gift that I've been given. I better do something good and right by it. Oh, you certainly have done that, sir. Oh, it's still fun. Other than just your natural creativity, what else is there that you're really passionate about? Well, um, you know, I think I think one of the one of the gifts that I have is my dyslexia, and I didn't know I was dyslexic till uh, we found out that our oldest daughter, when she was fifteen, and we were still reading her texts to her, we took her and had her tested at the University of Minnesota, and they said she's dyslexic. And how, what does that mean? And we, when they told us what dyslexia was. Mary and I looked at each other and said, well, that's what we are. That's what we do. That's how we think. And then we discovered that every one of our children is dyslexic. And they were remediated by uh, a lady by the name of Arlene Sunday, who came to me after they were all kind of grown and up and out of college and doing good things in the world. And she said, what do I do? To do the, the, I've been working with people one on one all my life. Is there a way we can perpetuate this uh, with more people? And so uh, I put together uh, a team of Arlene and my daughter, Cindy. Uh, Cindy uh, has the patience and the ability to see how to connect things. Her dyslexia is an enormous help to her. And we built, they built the Sunday system, which is the core of our now very successful reading uh, remediation program that we have in most of the states in the United States. And that is the Windsor Learning Program? That's the Windsor Learning Program, and you can see that if you uh, just windsorlearning.com. And I would be remiss, there's one other uh, highly creative endeavor that you've got, and that is you've got a, a music publishing company here in Nashville. We do. We, uh, my daughter, Rhea, and I uh, started that uh, in 1985. 
and it grew out of uh, songs that I was writing in Minnesota. And then she uh, she heard some of my songs, some of the songs of friends of mine who were writing in Minnesota and said, I'll take those uh, and see what I can do. We ended up, and she and I ended up down in Nashville without even knowing what we were doing, sold a couple of the songs and found out that what we were doing was being a publishing company and representing writers. And so we bought a house on Music Row and we've been there since 1987. And uh, uh, it's been a wonderful journey. My daughter, Ree, has gone on to build that into uh, one of the, certainly one of the most successful independent publishing companies in Nashville. Yeah, you guys have a number of uh, number one singles, and I know you've got a Grammy and two CMA Song of the Year awards. That is true. Yeah, been fun. Well, let that be a lesson to you kids that there's no such thing as spreading yourself too thin. If you want to do four things, go do four things. Well, I think that comes through in my book. It's like I don't make a point of it, but it's as, as I was writing it, I became aware of the fact that, okay, I must have learned at an early, in early opportunities that don't be afraid to go ahead and take the chance, especially when you, well, at any time. Go ahead and take the risk. If you lose, you lose. If you make it, all the better. And, uh, you know, 95% of the ideas that all songwriters have and all idea developers have don't work. But that doesn't keep them from from doing it. It uh, just means that, uh, all right, that one didn't work, but let's see what else will work. Yeah, I love that advice there. Well, Ren, that brings us to the final segment of our interview. I will run to these questions very quickly. Uh, so first one, if your job only paid the bills and not a penny more, would you still continue to do it? Yes. What talent or skill do you not have that you wish you did? What skill do I wish I had that I don't have? Uh, I, I've always felt that I could do almost anything. Uh, it's a matter of choosing what to do. Hmm. I'll accept that answer. Fill in the blank. I am a success if I... Keep trying. Keep keep making one. And I am a failure if I... Don't keep uh, making one. <laughs> Fair enough. What's the single best piece of advice that you followed to get where you are today? It is, don't be afraid of risk. What is a piece of well-intentioned advice that you're glad you ignored? to get where you are today? Oh, oh, that's very clear to me. I had a friend who told me, stop trying to dabble in a lot of different things. What character trait do you like best about yourself? My sense of humor. What character trait do you like least about yourself? Uh, my getting too serious. <laughs> Fill in the blank. I believe every child should have the opportunity to... Believe they're creative. If you could suggest one piece of self-improvement that everyone on Earth would adopt, what would it be? To keep smiling, keep laughing. <laughs> uh, here's a fun one. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? It would be to tell everybody that we don't have to destroy each other in order to make our beliefs real. If you could have dinner with anyone alive or dead, who would it be? My wife. <laughs> That's beautiful, Ren. Uh, all right, an hospitable nearby planet has been discovered and you have been recruited to help colonize it. You may take any three personal items with you that you wish. What are they? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Oh, my tennis shoes and my golf clubs, uh, my art equipment. <laughs> All right. Final question. 
Uh, you have just won a Lifetime Achievement Award, and we want to hear your acceptance speech. So there won't be any music to cue you or rush you off the stage, so you can say all of the thank yous that you need. And if there's any personal cause that you feel really strongly about that you want to champion, this is your soapbox, so let her rip. It would be how lucky I've been to have born, been born in 1935 when we're coming out of the Depression. And uh, there weren't very many of us. It was, so I had an opportunity to go to a school that I, I wouldn't even think of applying to nowadays. And getting an education like that and then being able to go forward in the economic uh, and opportune system of give and take that we've lived in in our lives has been absolutely amazing and probably unprecedented in the history of man. Well, you were officially off the hot seat, Ren. That's all I've got for you, sir. Okay, Shane. <laughs> Well, good luck to you. Thank you, sir. It was a pleasure having you here today. Talk to you soon. Have a good one. Take care. Mm -hmm. Bye. Once again, that was toy and game inventor, author, and entrepreneur, Ren Geyer. You can read the complete stories behind several of the products and companies he's brought to the world at his website, rengeyer.com. That's R-E-Y-N-G-U-Y-E-R.com. I'd like to thank everyone for joining me today. You are listening to the Live to Create podcast, and this is Shane Ongren reminding you to dream big, be inspired, and live creatively.